Hey, my name is Jacinta and I'm one of the pastors at HTVV and it's a real joy to be with you today. I wonder, if you were asked to describe yourself, what would you say? I once heard someone say, if I had to describe myself in one word, it would be bad at following directions. When describing his intelligence, Oscar Wilde, the author, he once said, I am so clever that sometimes I don't understand a single word of what I'm saying. And my favorite from the American comedian George Carlin when he was asked to describe his appearance, I'm in shape. Round is a shape. And if I'm really honest, I've sort of thought of myself as a good girl for most of my life. One of my earliest memories was thinking to myself, I'm a pretty good person. I was six years old. And although it's not a bad thing to want to be good, to live a good life, my identity has so been shaped by goodness that for much of my life growing up, I felt in order to earn any love or respect from the people around me, I needed to be good and do good things. As long as I measured up, I was fine. I am a good girl. I achieve good things. And when I don't, my world doesn't quite make sense anymore. That is the story of my life you might have the opposite story. You might have felt from very early on in your life that you're not a good person at all. Maybe you're worried about sharing your story because it's too crazy, or maybe it's not crazy enough. Regardless of our stories and backgrounds and how we describe ourselves, God is the master storyteller of our lives. He knows your story more intimately than you or I could ever know. One of my favorite stories from scripture is that of Joseph. You know, a few weeks ago, Abel preached on the life of Joseph. So consider this part two if you'd like. And if you'd like to catch up on part one, you can watch his sermon on our YouTube channel. Joseph's life story can be found in Genesis, the first book in scripture. We find the story of Joseph towards the end of Genesis. But right at the start in chapter one, in the very beginning, God created the world and he called it good. At the end, in chapter 50, Joseph says to his brothers, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Somewhere along the line, between chapters 1 and 50, evil entered this world. At the start, God said it was good. And at the end, Joseph said God intended it for good. And in between, Joseph makes sense of his story. The summary of his story is that when he was young, Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. They were jealous of their father's Jacob's, their father Jacob's favoritism of Joseph. So they sold him into slavery and then they lied to their father and they said an animal had attacked Joseph. Now Joseph then ends up in Egypt. He lives through countless challenges, including being tempted by his boss's wife, spending some time in prison, and then eventually having found favor with Pharaoh, he becomes second in command over all of Egypt. Years later, a famine takes place and Joseph finds himself in charge of distributing the supplies. His brothers travel from Canaan to Egypt to get some food supplies and they find themselves in the same room as Joseph. But after all these years, they do not recognize him. So here's where we find ourselves in the story. Let's read together from Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 to 5. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Amen. Now, this was Joseph's big reveal, when after all these years of being separated from his siblings, he could finally share his story. I wonder if your life were a movie, what would some of the scenes be? You know, the ones that shaped you into who you are today. How would you describe your story? And how do you make sense of it? 
I believe that God wants us to live good, full, and fruitful lives. But not only that, He wants to transform us into His likeness to be the best version of ourselves that He calls us to be. We need to have an awareness of who we are so we know who we are on the journey to become. To do that, we need to make sense of our story. But you might be asking, how do we make sense of our story? Well, the first thing to do is to share your story. You know, Jesus loved to tell stories. Instead of saying, love your neighbors, He told the story of the Good Samaritan. Instead of saying, God loves you, He told the story of the prodigal son. Jesus knew that as humans, we think in stories, we remember in stories, and we make sense of any of our experiences in the shape of a story. Just as He told stories, Jesus calls us to share our story. You know, when I landed in university in America, the first time I'd ever been in the States, one of the first pe people I met was a senior. She was a couple of years older than me, and she sat me down. I think it was written all over my face that uh, I had no clue what I was doing. I was this clueless kid from Malaysia. And then she asked me, what's your story? Fortunately for her, I didn't go, well, going back to when I was six years old, I've always thought of myself as a good girl. And then in primary school and secondary school, these are all the things that happened. I, I didn't say that. But, you know, I still remember that conversation so well. We had only just met but we connected instantly. We went on for hours. We laughed a little. We cried a little. I got to hear her story as well. All because of one simple question. What's your story? You know, in the passage we just read, after a long drawn-out conversation between Joseph and his brothers, he finally shares his story. Joseph said in verse 4, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And then he proceeded to tell them what happened since then. He has been made Lord of all Egypt. There's been two years of famine and there are five more years to come. And then in verse 15, it says, And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. Dan McAdams, a psychology professor, he interviewed more than 500 people to share stories about their lives. And he found that those who shared stories with a redemptive arc where bad events have good outcomes, they tended to be happier in the long run and have more hope. You know, these people, did, they didn't just jump to happy endings. They didn't just gloss over the hard stuff. But instead, they went into detail about their stories. They described their mixed feelings, their ups and downs. They sat in their grief. They framed their challenges as something they learned from. It was these individuals who had the highest levels of well-being and gained the most wisdom. Joseph, he didn't gloss over his feelings. Since he met his brothers in chapter 42, it says Joseph wept at least seven times. It says in Genesis 43 verse 30, deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. You may have heard about Coco the gorilla. You know, animals are not known to cry out of sadness, uh, but Coco was known to be quite a special one. She cried several times, one time when her kitten had died, and another time when she heard about the death of Robin Williams, the actor that she had spent quite a bit of time earlier on in her life with. And I learned recently that the act of crying, it actually releases oxytocin and endorphins, it flushes out stress hormones and other toxins. So in other words, when we cry, when we share our stories, there is healing in our weeping. When our stories are shared, our struggles begin to surface. When our challenges are shared, we're reminded of our purpose. When our victories are declared, we're reminded who our God is. Because you see, the enemy wants us to suppress our story, but God wants us to release it. The world's idea of identity formation is self-actualization, but the Christian worldview is friendship with God because we will know who we are when we know whose we are. Our stories are most powerful when they're about the God who is at work in our lives. All through Scripture, we see God's invitation to share our stories. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, Paul, his prisoner. In John's Gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, And you also will bear witness. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus says to the demon-possessed men, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. 
And we see this happen in connect groups all across HTVB. I think of a couple of people who uh, they shared with us that after years of battling with a secret addiction, they managed to put a stop to it because they shared their story with someone. And if you find yourself in a rut today, I wonder if you'd be willing to share your story with someone you trust. You could text them, invite them for coffee, and then simply just share your story. Not just what you do for work or for fun, but the inner parts of your life, your hopes and dreams, your past hurts, present struggles. Because when you share your story, it's good for you, but it's also good for others too. A friend told me recently that her church here in KL had an ongoing struggle. You know, it's a story that marked that season in the life of the church for many years. You see, they have a cross on their building and every night it would shine bright red and people all across Sento could see it. Now, the problem was the local authorities didn't quite like how obvious the cross was, hence the struggle. But they persisted in keeping the cross lit. Until one night, someone staying in a hotel across the street, he went up to the rooftop. He intended to take his life. And as he was about to jump off, he saw the brightly lit cross. He felt the Lord speaking to him so clearly, and he decided not to take his life. Instead, he ran across the street to the church, and he gave his life to Jesus because Jesus had saved his life. Your story can save someone's life. When Joseph began to share his story, he first said to his brothers in verse 4, Come close to me. You see, every time we share our stories, it's an invitation for connection. It means taking off our masks, allowing ourselves to be seen, and in that, find belonging. Community is built on the foundation of authenticity because we impress people with our strengths, but we connect with them through our weaknesses. It's in sharing our struggles, we build awareness of our stories, develop empathy for others, and begin to see how God is at work in our lives. The second thing to do as we make sense of our story is to recognize the patterns of our past. Now, making sense of our lives through understanding patterns comes quite naturally to us as humans. It's so innate that even babies learn and grow through patterns. Our son, Levi, he's two and a half years old and he generally loves going to school But some mornings, he's not in the mood for school at all, and he makes it very clear to everyone. And on these mornings, he he declares very loudly to our household, I don't want to go to school. But you know, we're good Asian parents, so we insist on him going anyway. But the challenge is, in the season, his school has had to close each time a child tests positive for for COVID, as with many other schools. Uh, And the first time it happened, we explained to Levi, school is closed because your friend is sick. The second time it happened, we explained, school is closed because your friend is sick. He saw a pattern emerge. So one morning, as I go into his bedroom to pick him up from his cot, the very first first thing he says to me is not, good morning, but with a concerned look on his face, he looks at me and he says, my friend is sick. The scientist Fritjof Capra, he said, the understanding of life begins with the understanding of patterns. The understanding of our lives begins with understanding the patterns of our past. Now, Joseph, he came from a very rich past. He came from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph's father was Jacob. Jacob's father was Isaac. And Isaac's father was Abraham. And all through Scripture, God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said in Exodus 3, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob This is my name forever, the name you shall shall call me from generation to generation. This is how God wanted to be remembered. And this is significant because it signaled that God had made a promise to bless the line of Abraham. And he would do that by blessing this line with many descendants. You know, so every time scripture refers to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, It was saying that this blessing will pass through the generations to their children and their children's children. Why is that? Well, God is a generational God, and we were made in the image of a God who's not only father and son, but also a God who thought of the very idea of family. When God created humanity, He began with Adam and Eve and their children, a family. And actually, the Bible holds a lot of respect for family trees. Scripture records at least 166 instances of the word 
generation. The Gospel of Matthew begins with Jesus' family tree. Entire books are dedicated to detailing family trees and the links through each generation, like the book of Numbers. When Levi was just a couple of months old, my mother-in-law said that when Levi smiles, he looks like me. And when he frowns, he looks like Abel. Since then, she's become my favourite family member. Just as physical traits are passed down from parent to child, so are other things. Personality, food preferences, even our impulse reactions. We see this in Joseph's lineage. You see, even though Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were affirmed as men of faith, even though they were good men, and even though it was through the line of Abraham that God chose to release His blessing, the reality was they were human, just like all of us. And scripture is real. It doesn't hide any flaws. In Genesis chapter 12, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while, because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. To protect himself from murder, Abraham told a white lie, and he said his wife Sarah was his sister. So if this was Abraham's impulse reaction in a time of famine, what about with his son, Isaac? You see, Isaac wasn't even born when Abraham lied about Sarah, but this is what it says a few chapters down. Now there was a famine in the land, so Isaac stayed in Gerah. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister, because he was afraid to say, She's my wife. He thought, The men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah, because she is beautiful. Isaac said the exact same script. This tendency to lie in the face of a crisis, it gets passed down. And so when it gets to Jacob's generation, we see deception as well. Jacob lies to get the blessing meant for his brother Esau. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Genesis 27. Later on, his father Isaac says, he was double confirming. Are you really my son Esau? He asked. Jacob replied, I am. So Jacob lies as well. And so when we get to Jacob's son, Joseph's generation, we see a pattern of deception in Joseph's brothers too. After they sold Joseph into slavery, his brothers lied and they said instead, an animal had attacked Joseph. You see, there were spiritual blessings that came with being from the line of Abraham, but there were also very human tendencies that were passed down too. If their lives were a movie, the script that was handed down said, In a time of famine and crisis, my instant reaction is to protect my pride and to tell a lie. Just as we inherit positive patterns from our parents, patterns of hard work, business acumen, or hospitality, we inherit patterns we need to grow from as well. Pete Sketzero, the pastor who wrote the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, he says it like this, Jesus may live in your heart, but Grandpa lives in your bones. And so as we begin to make sense of our story, I wonder what are the scripts that play out in your family? You may have come from a family that has loved you and championed you and provided all that you need. We thank God for that. The church needs more families that look like that. Or you may have come from a family that's been a bit more tricky to navigate. With God, the promise is that nothing in your story is wasted. As God transforms us into His likeness, He takes our ashes and turns them to beauty. He takes our mourning and turns it to joy. He takes our spirit of despair and turns it into a garment of praise. With God in our lives, we can celebrate the past, recognize our patterns, push past the pain, and course correct into the future. Because greater than the patterns of your past are God's plans and promises for your future. I think of my students who had everything stacked up against them. 
Before I joined the team here at HDBB, I taught mathematics in a challenging school. And uh, I think when I signed up for the Teach for Malaysia program, I wasn't fully aware what I was getting into. The students I taught had never, ever passed a math exam before. They grew up in a neighborhood where their parents didn't finish secondary school, let alone considered going to university. They were years behind where they should be. They didn't want to be in school. And let's just say at the end of every day, there were lots of tears, not just for my students. I just remember feeling so overwhelmed. So one day I prayed and I felt God just saying to me, love them towards their potential. Love them towards their potential. And so that's what I did. My students were sitting for their PMR exams that year and I began to gather a small group on weekday nights to do extra classes in one of the few almost free spaces available in the neighborhood, KFC. I say almost free because it was one box of cheesy wedges for 10 students and me. And then a student would invite their friend and another and another until at some point we nearly took over the entire KFC. I was so proud of my students as I watched them teach one another, work hard at their math. They pushed against the patterns of their past. And when their PMR results came out, we were just astounded. In the past, the school's pass rate would be less than 50%, but that year the pass rate was 90%, and many of them achieved Bs and even As. These students, they recognized the patterns of their past, and they worked hard to push past them. And despite the script that Joseph was handed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, Joseph chose a different script. You see, in Genesis 47, it says, so Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt, and he gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramesses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their children. Although his brothers took him from their family and sold him into slavery, Joseph settled them in a new home. Although his brothers left him for dead, Joseph saved their lives. When his brothers said, take us as your slaves, Joseph chose to serve them. He said, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Joseph remembered the family he came from, but more than that, he remembered that greater than the patterns of his past are God's plans and promises for his future. How do we make sense of our lives? Firstly, we share our stories. Secondly, we recognize the patterns of our past. And thirdly, we pursue the plans and promises of God for our lives. After living a good and eventful life, in Genesis 50, Joseph was on his deathbed. He said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph had every right to bring up the ways his brothers had wronged him, but he never faulted them. Instead, he reminded them that God's promise of blessing is greater than the patterns of their past. But how did Joseph say this with such certainty? How did he know that God would take them up out of Egypt, that he would take them into the promised land? Well, I think it's because Joseph had seen God's hand with him as he made sense of the story of his life. Throughout the various challenges in his life, Scripture is clear. God was with Joseph in every season. Genesis 39 verse 20, While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. When Joseph was taken down to Egypt, the Lord was with him. When Joseph had been left for dead, with no clue the land he was going to, God came to his aid and took him to a land he had prepared for him. Greater than the patterns of Joseph's past is the pattern of God's presence with him. As you look back on your life, the seasons of grief and joy, heartache and hope, God was there with you. He wept with you, rejoiced with you in the boardroom, by the hospital bed, at your kitchen counter, in the difficult text messages. And he says, nothing in your story is wasted. Because as we make sense of our story, it's not just to process the past, but to walk transformed into the future. 
no matter the script that has been handed down to you, you can choose a different story because God can end the negative patterns of behavior and thinking today. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a car with two other women whom I'd just met. And as any good passenger, I tried to get to know them a little bit. I asked Venny, who was driving, how she became a Christian. She said that she grew up in a Hindu family, she married a Christian, but she had never really decided to follow Jesus until her husband was diagnosed with a heart condition. They had um, a very young daughter at the time, and her husband was given two months left to live. She was desperate for answers and desperate to get help and healing, so she went to a Hindu temple to pray. And as she stood before the various deities of the Hindu temple and asked for help, she heard a different voice from a different direction. This voice said, I am Jesus and I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It was almost as if Jesus was saying, you have come to find me in a place you didn't expect to find me, but here I am, the one and true living God. The only problem was when Veni heard those words, she heard them in Tamil, but she didn't understand any Tamil. So she went back home to ask her mother, who understands Tamil, what those words meant. Now, what she didn't know was that prior to this, Veni's mother, who wasn't a Christian, was asked by her grandmother, who was a Christian, to read the words of John 14 verse 6 from the Tamil Bible. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So fresh from the temple, having heard a voice break in during her moment of prayer, she went home to ask her mother, Mom, what do these words mean? And her mother, who had just read those words to her grandmother, said, she recognized immediately it was Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That was the beginning of their coming to faith in Jesus. It was that moment that Veni put her trust in Jesus. And although she didn't ask for healing for her husband, he was also miraculously healed. The doctors couldn't explain the heart condition anymore. Veni and her family now serve God in their local church. Where she once did not know Jesus, now she does. And the trajectory of their family has been changed forever. As we turn away from our past sin and we look towards the transforming power of the cross, God's promise in Exodus 20 verses 5 to 6 is although curses might last to the third and fourth generation, He shows love to a thousand generations. God's love for you is so great that His anger lasts only a moment, but His favour lasts a lifetime. And that's why that song, The Blessing, you may have heard it, it became in some ways the anthem over the pandemic. It resonated so deeply within us. Its lyrics are directly from Scripture, from Numbers chapter 6. His favour is upon you and a thousand generations and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children's children. His anger may last for a moment. The pandemic might last for a while. Our suffering might be temporary. Our grief might last for a season, but His favour lasts for a lifetime. Jesus took those curses to the cross and he, he paid the price once and for all. And through Him, we can walk into a future free, free from guilt, free from shame, free from past baggage and patterns of our past. As we give our lives to Jesus again and again, the Spirit works in our lives not to achieve behavior modification, but for our inner transformation. This is the good life. Not that I am good, but God in me is good. That as we make sense of our lives, we can declare that what was meant for evil, God intended for good. Through Jesus and in Jesus, we are part of His spiritual family tree. Through Him, we access the humility of David, the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Samson, the steadfastness of Noah, the prophetic gift of Samuel, the courage of Esther, the leadership gift of Deborah, and the friendship that Moses had with God because of Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. Our hope is found in Jesus. He has good plans for our future because greater than the patterns of our past, are God's plans and promises for our future. Amen. Let's just pray. 
you might want to hold out your hands like this, and I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to fill us afresh. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you love us and you're the author and perfecter of our lives. Would you come and speak to each one of us right now, wherever we are tuning in from? There might be someone watching this and you don't actually know very much about your family of origin. And I think the Lord is wanting to say to you, I am your father. The church is your family. You can have access to the spiritual family tree because of Jesus. And I just want to encourage you today to just continue to put your trust in Jesus. There might also be someone here, um, you're beginning to think of, of the times in your past that have been quite painful. Um, and I just want to invite you to ask the Holy Spirit, God, where were you in that season of my life? When you felt absent, when, you, when I couldn't hear your voice, where were you in that season? It might be a present season right now. You might be asking, God, where are you in this season of my life? I think the Holy Spirit wants to bring comfort to you and He wants to remind you that He is with you. You only need to listen. So if that's you or if you have any other prayer requests, um, you can get in touch with one of our teams. We would love to be able to pray with you. Um, but let's finish now with one final song of worship. Yeah.